Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, all together. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it unto the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burned up, and all green grass was burned up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became wormwood. And the men died of the waters, because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened. And the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Amen. Let me get set up here. Right along with Revelation. Chapter number 16, good to see everyone tonight. How many have never sung that before? Did you think to pray? Did you think to pray? Is that, is that familiar to most of you? And, uh, have you heard that? Had you heard that before, Brother Ron? Yeah, Sister Cato, Cato Tabernacle, we used to come on with that. Was that, there, was that a, a theme song? That was the same theme song. Oh, my. My, my. If, if y'all don't know what we're mentioning regarding the Cato Tabernacle, there's a little piece of history you ought to uh, become familiar with and uh, know something about the history. That's 
of the revival period that took place. There was a revival period that took place in the city of Indianapolis. And uh, at, at some point, B.R. Lakin pastored that. After I don't know if, after Howard Cadle uh, was gone, I don't know if, if Dr. Lakin was the next one or somebody in between. Do you, do you remember? I think there was somebody before him. It was him and then there was, uh, I think, a Ford. Oh, um, that's the Ford that wrote God's Simple Plan of Salvation. Did he Did he take that for a while? It's been so long. I, I, sorry, I can't remember all the details. <coughs> he, he started a church later out on the east side, on the west side of the town. And... Uh, and I know that B.R. Lakin was there for I don't for some time. I don't know how many years. And so there were some great men. Now, if you want to get a good book, also by it's also by Doctor Beller, James Beller. We don't have any of those here. The Spirit of St. Louis. There's we have the uh, America in Crimson Red here, written by James Beller might be a copy back there uh, and he wrote another book he wrote several other books but he wrote another book called uh, uh, the spirit of st. Louis and it was about genuine revival that broke out in the city of st. Louis at the turn of the last century late late 1800s into the 1900s and I don't know that People, we, you know, people talk about the, the uh, various revivals in Europe and the British Isles and so so forth, the Welsh revival and, and all that. Uh, there were there were periods like that in the United States and some place. There was a there was a um, well that was in St. Louis. There, I know that even Billy Sunday was involved in that. One. And then there was a man named. Brooks, and he was a Presbyterian. He was a fundamental Presbyterian preacher who was involved in that. And he pastored, if I remember, the Second Avenue Presbyterian Church in St. Louis, and God mightily used him. He was a great Bible teacher. Uh, and that revival seemed to have kind of migrated to Indianapolis over the next several decades after I'm not saying that it had actually cooled down in St. Louis I'd have to go back and see where it overlapped uh, but uh, it, it a lot of that influenced the city of uh, Indianapolis for several decades and I know that the church planting that went on in Indianapolis was I mean, unbelievable because of so, so many that had been saved, including the old Indianapolis Baptist Temple, <laughs> which we knew of personally. And there is still the Indianapolis Baptist Temple, but the, the old building is not there. Uh, the, the big edifice that had risen there under Doc Dixon is not there. Um, but his son... Greg Jr., Greg Dixon Jr., uh, still pastors the church, which is really the, the assembly. You know, you can't pastor a building anyway. Just try. Just try. <laughs> it'll, it'll beat you up. <laughs> um, yeah, you can only pastor a congregation, amen? You can only pastor people, real people. Though, when, when we are saying he pastors the Greg Dixon Jr. pastors the Indianapolis Baptist Temple. Now, uh, we mean the congregation, and they're down on they're down on the south side of town, if I remember correctly. Now, but uh, in a in an entirely different location. But I'm just I'm just saying there was a, there was that period that that was one church that was a result. Or you could say the revival opened up the doors for many of those churches to grow quickly when they were planted, which is always a nice thing, always a, you know a blessing. 
So there's a lot of that. I don't know how I got off on that, really, but. Uh, Where did that be? Where did the song? What the song about the song? So did they have a radio, did they have a radio program, Cable Tabernacle? Yes, uh, it came on about uh, seven fifteen. 7.30, and I think it was 15 minutes, and uh, about the time that that would come on, and I would hear Sister Cato beginning, my dad would say, it's time to rise and shine, and I had to get the milk and done and put her things before I went to school. <laughs> and that's something, and that's something. All right, so thank God for those periods of time. There was actually a revival period in Los Angeles. I mean, it was genuine. It was it was spontaneous, and uh, uh, Robert Fuller, the old Robert Fuller, and uh, uh, now the the I, I only know the Baptist church is involved in it, but the 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 down right downtown still today there's the Los Angeles Baptist Tabernacle. Can't remember the pastor's name. He said, if he hasn't passed away just recently, I'm still there. And the name isn't coming to me. He and I used to correspond uh, regularly when I was in the Philip when we were in the Philippines. Do you remember the friend sent me the books on from Los Angeles? And uh, that was quite a. They have a, they have services in in that church even now that are preached in English and simultaneously translated into Chinese on one side by a man over here and in Spanish by a man over here. Every service. And the congregation is full of, you know, bilingual people and binational people or trinational, I don't know. Uh, but it's got a lot of Hispanics and there's a lot of, a lot of Chinese, of course, in Los Angeles. And it attracts it attracts those people, and as far as I know, it's packed out. And they, and it's a fundamental <coughs> believing church, and uh, soul winning church. Um, I can't remember this. Huh? Heimers. Heimers, thank you. Heimers, and that's he, his. Is, it's Robert Heimers, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Robert. Yeah. yeah, it's Robert Heimers. And uh, he was very kind. He saw some of the things that I had written and that, that got out on the internet way back in <laughs> 90. We had, we, we had, by the time, by the time we had the internet, you know, 98, 99. But it was a little late, a couple of years. We already were out at the camp when he sent those books. He read some material that I had written and, uh, and said, oh, I, I want to help that brother with some books. When he sent the books, I didn't know if I needed correction or whether he was just trying to. <laughs> no, he, he was trying to be an encouragement to me. I appreciate that. Amen. He just, I don't know how, who directed him to anything that I had, but he was trying to be an encouragement. I appreciate that a lot. And, I, and so I looked at their website and I started looking at, you know, reading things that he wrote. And, and uh, I've gone to his uh, preaching more than once when I've had an idea about a message and I've gone to his preaching more than once on the internet to see if he's a, he had ever preached a message on that particular subject. Robert Heimers, R.L. Heimers or something like R.L. Heimers, yeah. So, uh, and in that church was a result, the Los Angeles Baptist Tabernacle was a result of that revival that Robert Fuller was involved in and other uh, old fundamentalist men. Before Jerry Falwell had the old time gospel hour, uh, Fuller had the old time revival hour, I believe, on the radio, called the old time revival hour. That was years and years ago. You, you, might, you might be able to hear recordings of it on the internet, I'm not sure. You look that up. Old Time Revival Hour, Robert Fuller. Now, they named the Fuller Theological Seminary after him. But 
I wouldn't recommend anybody go to the Fuller Theological Seminary today. It's gone liberal. It's gone. But he was not. He was not a liberal. He was a, he was a Bible believing, strong, fundamentalist preacher. Amen. In that day. So it's, I, I think. I think out of his ministry came Biola in the early days, Biola College, which was a Bible at the beginning, a Bible believing school. Now I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch it. You know, it, that's sad, isn't it? Yeah, that's sad. But that's what happens. That's what happens. All right. Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for the Bible and what it does. Amen. We thank you, Father, when people believe it, it does work. Amen. And Lord, it, we can say it works even when people don't believe it. Yes. But we thank you for your word, and we do thank you, Father, for men that you brought up over the years, men that have, uh, even though they'd be dead, yet speak it, men that have been encouraged our ministries and been a blessing and a help to our ministries, even though we never saw those men talk to those men, or in, ever in one service, one church service, Father, but knowing about their lives and the faithfulness of their ministries, Father, has helped us just as much as reading about many of the men back in the 17, 1800s. So, Father, we do thank you for what you've done in our country and all over this country by the preaching of the Word of God. Lord, we are grieved that in this hour about what is happening to our nation and we pray for our nation tonight. Yeah. Lord, I still believe the same thing that brought revival previously yeah. would bring revival today. Amen. If people would listen to the word of God and yield their hearts to thee. I do pray, Father, for that to take place in our country. I do not know how widespread you will work in that area. We know there are many judgments already upon our land. Father, it seems like you have, and I've even said it this way, mortally wounded our country and letting us bleed out slowly. But Lord, I do believe that here and there, a church, an individual, a group, a small fellowship, Father, or a town can still experience revival. I pray for that, Father, tonight. Pray, Lord, for the influence of it in our land. I do ask, Heavenly Father, that you would touch our government, touch our the leaders of our country. What have we got left, Lord? I do, I do not know what we have left for leaders in this land. But we pray, Father, whoever they are, that the Word of God would affect them, influence them. That you would play, place, Father, strong Christian testimonies in people around those who lead our country. May they not be able to act one way or another, Father, without their conscience being smitten by the Spirit of God and the Word of God because of what they hear from a servant of thine that somewhere placed by you, by divine appointment, Father, where leaders can hear their testimony and hear the Word of God. Father, we pray for these that we've mentioned tonight that are sick and in need of your touch. Yeah, Father, we pray for doctors who are helping in each case. For example, with the with Chloe's uh, baby, we pray, Father, for the doctors as well. We pray, Father, for those that are in need of, of uh, surgeries yet. We pray, Father, for the doctors as well as the patient. Ask, Father, that you would give great wisdom and great uh, skill, great attention, Father, to, the, to their cases. I pray, Father, that you would uh, touch Brother Ron's brother-in-law, John. And I ask, Father, that uh, we know it, with age, it's more difficult to treat and heal. That is, as we look from a human level. Yeah. But, Lord, you can heal. And you can touch the doctor's hands. Amen. And you can give them uh, an alertness that they've never had before as they treat and as they, as they operate. So we pray, Father, for that in his case as in these others. 
We pray, Father, for Sister Sue, Sister Edna, and Sister Debbie tonight, wherever they are. Father, we know that all of them have difficult physical maladies, Father, of one sort or another, some serious and some not so. But I, but nevertheless, Father, we pray you touch them. For Brother Zyke, we pray, Father, for Brother Wayne tonight. We pray for that leg. Lord, it's a, uh, he's had several problems with that leg. And uh, from the time that it was first found swollen, Father, so badly in the bed there some several years ago. I pray, Father, that you would touch him. Pray, the Lord, that give him proper treatment. And Lord, again, we pray that you'd allow us to, to begin uh, a ministry even there, occasionally, once a month or once a week, whatever you would have us to do, Father, at the nursing home there, and even still here in town at, the, at our facilities here in town. Father, we ask that you would give us laborers as well as souls, and we pray, Lord, for the work you've given us to do uh, here. And we ask, Lord, that you would touch it and give us understanding of your will in every matter, Lord, as we labor. Father, we, we do pray for meetings coming up. We pray for Brother Pelkey's meeting in October. We pray for others, Lord, that, that are planning meetings uh, in this area, Father, may they be effective. May the preachers, Father, truly be used to bring souls to the Lord Jesus. Amen. And Father, uh, that it would spawn revival, a revival spirit, a love for the word of God, a love for prayer. Father, do touch our area here. And so thank you, Father, for the time you've given us tonight. Bless each one that is here. And I pray, Lord, that the word of God would be a help tonight. Use us, Father, use us as we look in the word of God. We'll be grateful for your help. In Jesus' precious name, amen, amen. All right, uh, we're, we are in 16, and I don't want to be redundant or just repetitive, but uh, I, was, uh, I was studying again here in the last couple of days uh, and uh, back in 16, chapter 16, verse number, verses 1 and 2. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And just that verse caused me to just to start running some, some scriptures and, and, and uh, just enjoying the Lord's presence as, as I looked in the word of God. And had a little bit of uh, revival with the Lord myself. Amen. A little, Amen. A little, a little touch. And it's, it's good when you study, when it's, uh, you feel a little touch. Amen. From God. Amen. Sitting there with you. And so I, I love, the Lord led me to uh, the 69th Psalm. And so I want you to turn there. And you say, well, will, will we ever get through this chapter? Well, I don't know. We'll get it some, sometime in the next couple of years, maybe. Psalm 69, amen, Psalm 69. Regardless, uh, whatever we do and however the Lord leads us in the book, we're covering a lot of scripture in the Bible itself, generally. And I don't know how you can study the Bible much without that happening if you're really studying the Bible. Yeah. If, if, you're, if you're not setting up your own agenda, you're letting the Spirit of God lead you through as you study a lot of times he'll take you down very many various paths and lead you as the Spirit of God would lead you all through the Word. Can you imagine the, the Spirit of God binding himself to one passage or another in the, in the Bible? I can't. I, I, the Spirit, this is all his, all his Word, amen. These are all the words of God, amen. And so in the 69th Psalm, I was, I was reading, and uh, let me just start at the, uh, well, for time tonight, brother brother Rains will brother Larry Rains will say say for time we'll just read and then he'll read a whole long long passage. <laughs> Amen. So uh, I don't have a long long passage, but in the twenty fourth verse, did you did you you still have in your mind what's in the 
Revelation chapter 16, verse number one, where it says, pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. In the 24th verse of the 69th Psalm, pour out thine indignation upon them and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute, they persecute him whom thou hast smitten. And they walk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. So I said, I want to read a little more of that. I got interested in the psalm again. And this is not an unfamiliar psalm because this is a redemption psalm as well as giving more or less of a plan of the ages. So when you go back up to verse number 20, reproach hath broken my heart and I'm full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. And I thought of the, I thought of the disciples sleeping while he was praying. Huh? Now look at the next verse. They gave me also gall for my meat. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Where was that? So you've got the garden, you've got the cross, and then he says, verse 22, let their table become a snare before them, and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Psalm 11, did you ever read Romans 11? Did you say Romans 11? I did. Romans 11, I'm sorry. Romans 11. Romans 11, verses 9 and 10. There you, there you have the... Old Testament a foundation for Romans chapter 11, verse 9 and 10 with regard to Israel and the redemption of Israel. And then in verse 23, so you've got, you've got the garden, you've got Calvary, you've got Israel after the cross, verse there in, in their God's desire to save them, and yet they still rejected the message, still rejected him, let their, so verse 23 says, let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continually to shake. Remember as a, 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 the loins, uh, just, as a, just as a woman in travail, remember? So you've got the tribulation period. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continually to shake. Verse 24, pour out thine indignation upon them and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents for they persecute him whom thou hast smitten and they talk to the, talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity and let them uh, not come into thy righteousness. So there's, there, uh, all Israel shall be saved, but not, not every individual that is of Israel, when, in, when Israel enters into the tribulation period, will be saved. Many of them will be destroyed under the wrath of God. Paul says they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Got that? They are not all Israel who are of Israel. You know, uh, there's a little picture of that today going on because there are a lot of people in the Middle East who find great rest from warfare and terror and, and uh, persecution right in the land of Israel, though they're not even Israelites. They are, they are Israelites by law because Israelite, Israel allows them to live there. But there are, there are people living in the land of Israel and boy, doesn't Benjamin Netanyahu and the Likud party know it. There are, there are those living in the land of Israel legally that if they had their chance would betray the land that is giving them peace. 
And they would fight with the Arabs, with the Muslims. And yet they're living, they're given peace. You know there are mosques in Israel. You know, most people never stop to think about that. That Israel has allowed Muslim Arabs to live inside of Israel, and they do business inside of Israel. And you can eat it a you can eat it an, uh, a a uh, what do they call it? What's the kind of a halal? You can eat at a halal restaurant inside Israel. Do you know that they are protected like Israel, like all the other Israelites? Though they are not Jews. Do you know they have police protection and military protection? Now, what is more gracious than that? <laughs> Let me ask you, what is more gracious than that of a nation? But you never hear the newspapers or the television news or anything talk about that. Huh? <clears throat> Verse number 28. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. As you have the word righteous in verse 27, you have it in verse number 28. Israel's only hope of righteousness is who? And, and, and let me say, while we're there, any man's only hope of righteousness is Christ. But here we're dealing with Israel. So verse 20, verse 29, but I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me up on high. I will praise the name of God. Watch this. I will praise the name of God. So you've got, you've got Amen. the garden. Of course, we could go back to the beginning of the psalm and get more. You've got the garden. You've got the cross. You've got Israel's. Uh, Israel's, the hope of redemption for Israel. Romans chapter number 11. You've got the tribulation period. All through here. All through here. What's missing, by the way, in here? The church is missing in here. There's a gap in here. Right? So you got the tribulation all the way down through verse number uh, 28. But then it says, but I am poor and sorrowful. Blessed are who, by the way? Blessed are the poor. So when you get to Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, you've got the constitution of the kingdom. You've got the constitution of the millennium. Except salvation is not there. We've said this in the last couple of weeks. Salvation is, salvation is not in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 because what is missing there? The blood. Salvation by grace is missing. So people that think that they're going to be saved by obeying Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, and much of, much of liberal Christendom, much of liberal Christendom, believes that salvation is in, in, is in the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, if we just stick with the Sermon on the Mount, we just stick with the Beatitudes, there's no blood there. There's no sacrifice there. Except for the mention, as we taught Sunday morning, about the man said, when you bring your sacrifice to the altar, remember we talked about that? And you, and, but you have all with you, all against your brother, what do you do with the sacrifice? And, and people read that today, think that's what? They think that's money being brought to the church. Well, what was it? What was the Lord talking about? He's talking about an animal sacrifice. When they brought the animal sacrifice to the, to the temple, to the priest, and the priest, uh-uh, you got a problem with your brother. They were to leave it there, go out and get, and reconcile with their brother, then come back and offer their, their offering. We're, you're still in the Old Testament in the, in the Beatitudes. You're still, and all the way, all of Matthew 5, 6, and 7 could be, can, you can go, go all the way back to Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy and see the basis for every point. And then the Lord said, and, but I say unto you. So the Lord is giving progressive revelation on his own words. He's a progressivist. The Lord Jesus is a progressivist. 
I, that's, I don't mean progressive in a political sense, as in socialism. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about progressive revelation. Yes. So the Lord brought the Beatitudes, what you read in the, well, what you read in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy particularly, brings it forward in, in his earthly ministry and gives, gives the people of Israel progressive revelation about those things. Now, don't get me wrong. If you read Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, and there is principle there that is proper Christian principle, obey it. Amen. Obey it. If it's, if it's principle that is that is that what takes you all the way through, it's it's something that is not not of a dispensational nature, it's truly of a character nature, uh, uh, and so forth. You certainly obey it. Alright? But there are things there that you can't um, uh, you you cannot there are certain in, inferences there about uh, how somebody becomes a child of God there that is not how you can become a child of God today. All right? So be very careful about be very careful about the reason the Lord gave those that further revelation. And plus remember the church is missing in these passages. The church is not given in these, but this, this period of time you and I live in, remember, with, uh, is, is a period of mystery with regard to revelation. And it's a period of, it is a period itself of revelation. It's a period of mystery. It's a period of revelation. And so the Old Testament, Satan knew nothing about it. And the, and the church, as we know in this dispensation, was not a church that was revealed in Matthew chapters five, six, and seven, everything there is everything there is very much kingdom doctrine. I'm talking about millennial doctrine. So watch this in verse twenty nine. This is this is why we we never get through the book of Revelation. <laughs> verse twenty nine. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me up where. Where does where you be in Christ? Are you, are you saved by God's grace? Where has it set you? In heavenly places. In heavenly places. It sets you up on high, hasn't it? Far above. Far above all heavens. Amen. <laughs> not, not, that's wonderful. And I don't know how to, I don't know how to approach it exactly, but, but the Lord is at the, in the third heaven at the right hand of God the Father, but he's been exalted above all heavens. Yes. First, second, and third. How about that? How do you preach that? Amen. So verse 29, I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, be set up on high. That's why I say David's kind of a little in a kind of a bubble, dispensationally speaking. And I will praise the name of God, watch this, with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. Amen. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bullock that hath horns and hoofs. I thought about preaching a message from verse 31. I call it better than horns and hoofs. Amen. <laughs> better than horns and hoofs. Amen. Thou shall it shall please the Lord. See what 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 are things that please the Lord more than sacrifice? Obedience. Hmm? Obedience. Obedience. Better than sacrifice. Will be what will be a hallmark or a key word of the millennium? Obedience. Obedience. So this, this also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bullock. So what have we slipped into? We've gone through the garden. We've gone, we've gone up to Calvary. We've, we've come down to Israel's uh, opportunity to be saved after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the church is not here. And we've gone into the tribulation period. And now where are we at? The millennium. This also will please the Lord better than an ox or bullock that have horns and hoofs. 
The humble shall see this and be glad, and your heart shall live and see God. For the Lord heareth the poor and despiseth not his prisoners. Let the heaven and earth praise him and seize and everything that moveth therein. For God will save Zion, see? This is a Zionist passage. This is a millennial passage. For God will save Zion and will build the cities of Judah that they may dwell there and have it in possession. That's the millennium. The seed also and his servants shall inherit it and they that love his name shall dwell therein. <laughs> it's a great psalm, isn't it? it is, it's a Zionist psalm. It's a millennial psalm. This is not a church psalm, but uh, I still love it, don't you? Amen. I still learn from it. I still get a lot. I still get anything I need right out of there. Belongs to our heads. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I got a I got a uh, a text from Brother Cooley today out in Oregon, and he was asking me about the resurrection of the Old Testament saints, and I said. I said, well, I've been enjoying studying on the restoration and conversion of Israel. And I said, and some of that about David is in my notes. He said, oh, oh, <laughs> it is. I said, yeah, I'll just take pictures of my notes and send them to you. Oh, okay, that'd be a blessing. <laughs> Brother Cooley's a Bible man. I don't know. He Really, he doesn't need me. Brother Cooley's way beyond me. He's a fine, fine Bible student and preacher. He's a, he's, a, sorry, he's a preacher. Woo, he's a preacher. He'll preach, he'll preach behind the pulpit, on top of the pulpit, jumping down over the pulpit. He just, I mean, he just preach. He's, he's a preacher. He's the, he, he's, we have him on our radio. But we have him on, the, on our stream every day. And uh, one, one time, she come on? Six? Seven? Seven. Huh? Seven. In the, somewhere in the seven o'clock hour. On our stream, you'll get Brother Cooley. Yeah, he, it's the best. It's the best. Hey, you can't go to any Sunday school and get better, can you? You can't go to any Sunday school in any church and get better than what you get from Brother Cooley in that 15. I think you play two of them, don't you, back to back? So you get a half hour of Brother Cooley in the 7 o'clock. I heard him in Huh? I heard him in Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah. He's way beyond. He is way beyond. And 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 just a, a good spirit about him. But when he's in the pulpit, he starts out about like he's on on the stream. When you hear him on the stream, or you heard him in Sunday school, uh, he starts out about that way when he's preaching. And uh, then God will get on him, and he he just jump right out of the saddle and get to running. And uh, you just better buckle. You just better buckle your seatbelt. Am I telling the truth? Son, he preached. He will preach. Amen. So you see the progression in the see the progression of Revelation in that psalm. And if you start at the beginning of the psalm, you'll get some other things related. Okay, but we didn't we don't have that time. But that's related in chapter sixteen of the book of Revelation because. God pours out or had it commands to pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And then you start down, you start down with the with the first, you know. The the first in these verses, verse two, and the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. I know we're repeating some things. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshiped. His image. So the first judgment that came upon the persons of Egypt in Exodus chapter number 9 are like this. And it has to do with the, with the, with the sore that comes out from the inside. These noisome sores is, are like boils. Where do, you know, where bo boils don't start on the skin. Where do they start? You know? They start on the inside of the body. They start in the blood. You've heard me tell when I had boils. I had boils when I was young, and I had really had a bad case of the boils when I was a, uh, a freshman in high school. I had to go sitting class 
And I had boils where you ought not have boils if you're going to sit in the class. <laughs> in class, you can't sit. And I actually had to stand in the back of the classroom. And people, and others, other kids were saying, you know, saying, well, "Why are you standing in the back? Are you in trouble?" I said, "I'm in bad trouble. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't sit in a chair because I had boil." And the, and the doctor told my mother, "Don't give him any pork for years." I didn't, not for years, for a year or two. I hardly had a, a taste of pork at all. The dog and I, and and the boils went away. And there was probably a time when I was sensitive to, especially to pork. Pork is an unclean meat. I don't know if that doctor was a Jew or, or, or not, but it didn't matter. He recognized that there were things in pork that in, in some, especially young people, it caused uh, boils. And I, listen, I don't know. I heard this. I heard this, and you'd have to check it out. But all this medicine that is spent on clearing up acne, there's some indication too that a lot that breaks out on your skin in acne has to do with pork. I just heard that. I just heard that. I'm not a doctor. You can check that out. But it's it doesn't start on the outside. It starts on the inside. So what's happening? What's happening when it when they it says that uh, the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshiped the image. So it is corruption. Will you, can you say amen to that? It's corruption inside that makes, makes those people accept the mark of the beast or the number of his name. And it's connected with moral apostate conditions in the earth. But it's in, it starts where? It never starts in, out here somewhere in the earth. It starts where? Where does it start? It comes out of the hearts of men. It comes directly out of the hearts of men. So in verse number three, the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man. We covered this last week. And every living soul died in the sea. And you can put in your margin. I, what I tried to do is get some of the uh, Exodus references for you to write in your margin or your notes. And you would want to put Exodus chapter 7, verses 17 to 25. Poured out, it, it was poured out on the sea. You remember the, remember the rivers becoming blood in Egypt and all of that? And you've got that here. And so write down in your margin, Exodus chapter 7, verses 17 to 25. We won't... We won't uh, read that, but uh, and let me say this, and, and we'll stop for tonight. In when remember when James <coughs> deals with healing and prayer, and remember we said this when Sunday. Well, we brought it up Sunday sometime, huh? Wednesday, or last Wednesday, and then Sunday. And so when you uh, uh, in the during the tribulation period when they. They don't have the mark of the beast. They don't have the number of his name. They can't go to the hospital. They can't go to a doctor. They can't go to the, they can't go to CBS. Brother Thurman was complaining today. I saw on Facebook. He was complaining. He's, he said, "Sure, would love to have a CBS pharmacy that works." So I said, "I said, you mean you have a CBS pharmacy, but dot 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 dot." He said, "Yeah, that's right." So, uh, but think about people in the tribulation period. If there's a CVS pharmacy or any kind of source of medicine, they won't have any way to buy it. Okay. So prayer, laying on of hands, right? And what about what about a case where there's nothing to drink but blood? What about a case when all the water's turned to blood? And it's a, it's the blood of a dead man. It's like the blood of a dead man. Yeah. It's already corrupt. It's already horrible. Right? Now, what do you think God can do in the tribulation period for his children? Amen. You think he can turn the blood turn blood for, back into water, water for his children? Absolutely. Amen. Hey, how about how about how about God letting water come out of a rock? 
Say, if you don't think you, you don't think sometimes Brother Bob believes in miracles and things like that happening, hey, I I absolutely believe in them. Yeah, yeah, they're going to pass through the same area too during the tribulation period. They're going to come down the kings, the the Jews that are taken out. Remember, don't don't come down from the roof rooftop, right? Two two abiding in the field. One shall be taken, that means destroyed, and the other left. That's not a rapture, that's a destruction. If you're two in the field, one shall be taken, taken out, taken in judgment, taken in death. The other's going to be left. Where's he got to go? God's going to remove him out into a safe place. Grinding at the mill, too, right? Sleeping in the bed, too. All right? So... One's going, to be, one's going to be taken by the judgments that you're reading here. And the other is going to be left. And God, is, God has a place to protect a believing Jew in the tribulation period. And they're going to come down when the king is coming, when the, when the skies open up and the king is coming down. I'm talking about when he's Lord. coming down to the earth. Lord. They're going to be coming down. He, he and them are going to be coming down the king's highway back into the land. So when they need water, when the God turns, when, when God tells the angel, pour out that vial, and it, and it turns the waters into blood, turns the sea into blood, and then next it turns the rivers into blood, and there's nothing to drink, and they, they're not going to work. They're going to... They're going to be out there in the wilderness and they're going to say, hey, our people have gone through this before. Let's just wait on God. That generation is going to say, wait on God. It won't be just one man like Moses saying, hey, y'all better wait, y'all better wait. No, that, that generation will be saying, let's look to God. I bet God will make water come out of rocks. Amen. I would God will just provide coming down the king's highway back into the land. Won't that be wonderful? Amen. Won't that be wonderful? So don't think that we, the way we preach dispensational truth and the breakdown of things, we don't we don't believe in miracles. We absolutely believe in miracles. We just know where they're placed in the Bible. So we don't get in trouble. Amen. Amen. We know where they're placed in the Bible. So we rejoice over it. We rejoice over the creative hand of God. We rejoice over the miracle hand of God. We rejoice over answered prayer. We rejoice over all, all those things. Amen. But we know where the place for those things is in, in the Bible. We believe in tongues. But we believe that there's a place for those tongues. And a purpose for those tongues. Amen. So that we don't get in a jam. Right now. <laughs> Amen. 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 Now my tongue likes jam. But not that kind of jam. Amen. <laughs> Alright right, David better bring us a song. I know I've been. Last couple of weeks I've been. I've kept you late. David bring us a song. A chorus. Whatever. <laughs> I do like that. I suppose of all of the songs about prayer, that's my favorite. I, I don't know of anyone I love better than that. Did you think to pray? It's convicting, isn't it? Strikes right at the heart. It asks the right question. Amen. Did you think to pray? In, in temptation, did you think to pray? In sorrow, did you think to pray? In trial, did you think to pray? Amen. That's a great song. And I don't know of anyone on any song on prayer that I like better than that one. I'm not saying he has to sing that now. Maybe Jill passes out here a second so I should have one.